Hello and welcome to Stories Across Borders. Here we discuss stories told across a range of different mediums, books, movies, games, comics, you name it. The only rule is that we can only discuss things in terms of writing. Anything like acting, art or animation is out unless it directly relates to how the story is being told. I am Daniel Radford, author, space migrant and also your host. And today I'm joined once again by John Kernan. That's me, here, floating off in space as always. We continue our cycle of uh, episodes on positivity today with uh, Stephen McCraney's webcomic Space Boy, which is uh, a favourite of mine for a bunch of reasons. So as a matter of principle and for the benefit of both you, our lovely audience, and John, who isn't up to date yet, we'll do our best to avoid spoilers, but as always, it's pretty hard to have an in-depth conversation of us about a story without giving some stuff away. True. Sure. So you're just starting it, right? You're, you're still pretty early days. Yeah, I'm only on episode 47, which might sound like a high number, but there's like 300 and something, so... So far. You are, you are, you are catching up at a good time. At the time of recording, it is currently on hold uh, for a short time. No. Oh. It'll be back. So what are you thinking? Uh, 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 any general thoughts you want to share? I like it a whole heckin' lot. It's... It's my favorite kind of positivity. It's realistic enough. There's just like bad things that happen. It's not all goodness all the time, but there's just this constant undercurrent of warmth and everybody in it is, so far at least, is just doing their best in some way or another and like they do a good job showing that off. It's, God, I don't know. I'm saying a bunch of dumb cliche stuff, but it's just been really nice. It's it has the most it has the most important thing, in my opinion, for anything that's like trying to be really positive or with a really positive vibe to have, and that's uh it's earnest. It's very honest and genuine. Yeah, I I think that it does have a very sort of earnest vibe to it, I would say. Uh it it feels easy to relate to it even if you have experience don't have any experiences, anything even remotely like what the characters are feeling. You know, I might be biased a little bit, having having spent 30 years in space myself. <laughs> but you touched on something uh, which is really kind of the crux of why I wanted to do this particular story for this particular theme, which is that when you talk about stories that are you know, feel good and positive, uh, as we touched on this earlier as well in previous episodes, a lot of the time, what people picture is stories that are, like, devoid of any drama or conflict. And I think Space Boy is a perfect illustration of the fact that you can have a story that has conflict and drama, and that at times can actually get really dark, but that it does so in a way that allows characters to practice good coping mechanisms and i think that's where some of the, a lot of the positive atmosphere comes from is that rather than being all angsty and brooding uh, characters are willing to acknowledge their problems and work through them it's not always easy for them they don't always get there right away but it is always that sort of uphill climb always that support network for the characters they're always like willing to shared in that in that suffering and help figure things out it's it's important sometimes if you want to really appreciate the trueness of something to have the contrast of the nothing hmm. oliver knows a thing or two about that yeah I, contrast is as always an ever useful tool as a writer by highlighting the negatives it allows you to bring more attention to the positives and make it feel more impactful. Yeah, plus, you know, like how else are you supposed to how else are you supposed to believe it at all? You know, like having that kind of bad stuff and being able to show it, being able to show people falter and stumble emotionally or be in a bad place for a little while and then get through it or get better or get just the right kind of support from people who care about them and love them and all that is the difference between going, 
Oh, wow. Cool. Look, everything's just fine again and going, oh. There's a lot of that oh in this one. <laughs> Look at the baby chicks. They're so cute. They're so cute. <laughs> but yeah, part of like something that is, I think, worth noting is like Space Boy does a really good job of portraying things like depression and isolation and anxiety and grief all different and different flavors of those things no pun intended it's it's there's a lot of flavors in this that's for sure and uh, it's not just the synesthesia, uh, synesthesia is that how it's pronounced speaking yeah and the thing is as well like all those things are so central to the characters arcs and growth in the story like there's a big mystery in the story that uh you still haven't gotten too much about it yet, I don't think. There's all sorts of, like, really important plot stuff. And the later, you, of course, the later you get it, the more the plot does start to take to center stage to an extent. But that character element and the focus on very human-feeling characters uh, never really goes away. That's good. It's important to hold on to something like that. If they kept it going for 50 chapters and then later decided it wasn't so important anymore, I'd be really disappointed. No, it is always like... Even when the the, the focus shifts more to the plot, that character stuff is always still very visibly present. Good. Now, if only I could stop constantly thinking of Astro Boy and, like, five other sci-fi things I like when I'm reading this. I think, uh, I mean, the the influence is definitely there. It has to be, but I think the name is probably what I get stuck on the most. the The name, and even though I can't place exactly how he looks at him, every time I every time I look at Oliver uh, Oliver in my head, I'm just seeing a white haired teenager version of Astro Boy. Astro mm -hmm. Boy, if he could grow up and eyes. put a shirt on. <laughs> um, but yeah, one of the well, well, oh god, where was it? Yeah, what I was trying, something I was getting at before is that um, a lot of the subject matter, right, is is actually really mature, and it is presented in a way that feels very not not just true to the setting and characters, but true to reality, uh, the way like all these different emotions are portrayed. And struggles are portrayed, which is interesting because as a story, right, it's not really aimed primarily at an adult audience. Like clearly, it's it's accessible to an adult audience. It's complicated and deep enough to be engaging to an adult audience. But it's I think it is much more aimed at like young people. Yeah, it absolutely is. It's it's genuinely like a perfect young adult story, and not in the way that. YA is treated like its own, like a genre in and of itself nowadays, but like just it is it's it's perfect for young adults, really anybody like who it's perfect for anybody who thinks about that kind of stuff in general obviously, but it has just this perfect air of childishness and allowing itself to just be what it is a lot of the time without having to worry about the big heavy stuff that like it's perfect for somebody who likes real narratives and real plots and character development and stuff but doesn't always have to be reading um a, a john grisham lincoln law uh lincoln lawyer novel at the airport or something yeah, like it's not that it doesn't ever get heavy or deal with darker themes or anything like that, because it does deal with it. It starts it. out that way. Yeah, exactly. It hurts. But it does so in a way that it's easy for anyone to understand, relate to, and help and process. Yeah, and I exactly. think that's I think that's where that sort of earnestness comes in, right? Is that everything that it portray even though the world is very fantastical and the plot is very fantastical in a lot of ways the human element is very present and very genuine and that that adds something to the story in a lot of ways and that and that makes that 
positivity feel better because yeah. it's a it's a, it's an example of actual healthy positive coping mechanisms in the long run anyway <laughs> yeah they're they're mostly positive coping mechanisms and the ones that aren't positive that's when we have friends and loved ones and stuff to shadow them for us Curse to me, we've not actually told anyone what this story is about. We've just kept talking about how good it is. That's true. We've been, uh, <laughs> we, we kind of got, we kind of got right to how it fits the theme and how good it is without, uh, the preamble, I suppose. We should probably, uh, fix that before we get too far in. Uh, so here's the deal, audience, who are probably very confused right now. Space Comic is a web comic about... A lot of things, actually, but uh, the basic premise starts with this girl, Amy, a teenager from an asteroid colony out in the middle of space. She and her family get cryogenically frozen to move back to Earth, or to Earth, which is a th sort of 30-year journey, effectively. She, they don't age whilst they're cryo-frozen, but they arrive back there 30 years later and Amy is now alone in a world that she doesn't really understand, and all of her friends back home are now adults with their own children. Yeah, this, uh, I wouldn't say pseudo-sci-fi, but this is more like, this story is almost semi-sci-fi in that the technology isn't that far, isn't that far past our own. Uh, I don't remember if they put a year stamp on it, but it it honestly doesn't feel like it's more than, like, 40 or 50 years in the future as far as technology goes. Yeah, I, uh, the sci-fi elements are definitely there, but they are, A, very soft, where usually, other than the, the like long-distance space travel, usually they don't really go that hard into, like, that deep into the hard physics of any of it. It's more about the vibe. Yeah. Honestly, the, the most advanced feeling, the most advanced feeling thing about it isn't even any of the technology itself, but the fact that it's already spread so far and become so uniform that it's just normal everywhere yeah. already. But that does happen sometimes with some things. But whatever, the reason I brought up that point is because this is one of the very rare cases of a story we have where technology is advanced enough that people can colonize and live on a mining colony on an asteroid long term. But that we haven't adv invented any kind of fast or faster than light space travel yet. Which is why Amy's family has to get cryogenically frozen, because it takes them 30 years just to get to Earth. Exactly. So she gets to Earth, and you know, every, it's all different. The technology is different than what she's expecting. Atmosphere, I guess, is different. The, all of her friends back home have grown up. A lot of them have children of their own. And she finds herself in a situation where she's very much the fish out of water. She's she's Amy, so she's you know so very likable, and people have an easy time making friends with her and stuff. So eventually, she starts making new friends, and that's less of a problem. But it takes that's actually effort. one of the things I think they do the positivity here great too. Honestly, is that um she doesn't do at, at first she doesn't really do anything to make friends someone else makes friends with her. Another element of the positivity here that even though she's having a rough time and she's just kind of floating along at first and not not doing that much other than facing it all with a uh, smile, if a little bit of a lost smile, and only for, you know, nice guy, who's, I think, what, her lab partner at first in one of the classes to help her out, be really so. nice and positive, and then if you're as... If you're jaded and as used to so many tropes like we are, it's really easy to get a feeling of like, oh man, is there gonna be is there gonna be something going on here with this big buff, handsome blonde guy who's immediately started helping her and being super nice? No, he's and then he's the guy's the girlfriend same. runs up to him <laughs> and kisses him and you go like, Oh no, do we have a love triangle? And then no, the girlfriend is also immediately nice to her and doesn't act jealous or threatened at all or any of that dumb, dumb stuff that you can't get away from in stories. Yeah. They hit it off and they're friends right away and immediately like supportive of 
and uh, like taking her under their wing. Yeah, they they are uh, the first few people she meets and befriends. Like they are so understanding of her situation. Like not not in the sense that they've experienced it, and they can relate directly to it. But you know, everyone knows what it's like to feel out of place in a, in somewhere. So they make a point of being kind to her and showing her the ropes of how everything works and you know just being present and and positive and engaging presences in her life very empathetic and socially aware exactly uh, it's, it's beautiful yeah very true so that's the general gist of where we start we also uh, very soon after thereafter uh, come into oliver who is the other sort of main character of the story. The eponymous space boy, yes. if you will. He is the actual uh, the space boy in question, even though the a story is told al- almost entirely from Amy's perspective. It is, mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, Oliver's story. We get a, We get about a good 30 seconds to a minute depending on how fast a reader you are of the story being from oliver's perspective just long enough for him to be staring and be in a what looks like a very very extended staring contest with the empty void of space yeah you'll get more time from oliver's perspective later on but a lot of the mysteries of the uh of the plot directly relate to oliver and his life so it's a bit of a slow unravel there. I'm uh, excited. Um, Oliver is uh, perpetually alone. We ne- we almost never see him with anyone else. He keeps to himself. He's broody, of course. And uh, above all else, he is sad, depressed, and isolated. He He has spent so much time trapped in nothing and surrounded by nothing but nothing that he's kind of become obsessed with nothingness and actually kind of almost absorbed it as a personality trait. Well, more than that, it's his coping mechanism. That too. Uh, Yeah. He he shuts down because he doesn't want to feel because feeling hurts. Yeah. And you know, like not a spoiler to say this because it's the, it's something he says in his little opening monologue, although we don't know why yet for whatever reason, Oliver has lost his family, and whatever happened, it was thorough enough and tragic enough that he, that despite how depressing nothingness is, nothingness is also his safety blanket from the the trauma he's been through. And uh, that's, yeah, that's see, that, that's where a lot of the story is going to take you. It's unraveling the mystery of Oliver's life and his circumstances, and then. On the same side of that, the characters dealing with their own emotional baggage and helping each other get through it all. And, like, this yeah. this story goes places. Uh, there's a, I bet. Like, it, it tells you in the uh, early, early days, like, a lot of the story involves figuring out the truth behind a murder <laughs> and how it relates I'm... back to everything else. I'm really curious to find out if that scientist is Zeph's dad, because he looks like him. Huh. A little bit. They have the same hair and similar faces, except the scientist has a big ol' honkin' scientist nose. Everybody in fiction loves to give big nerds big noses. Dr. Kimizek is another very good character. He's fantastic. I look forward to learning more about him. There's a lot of little things I've been enjoying about it. Part of the reason, uh, another one, that the story encapsulates the positivity we're covering in this cycle so well is it does the exact thing we've already talked about and that it's 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 not just positive and that everybody is being nice and friendly all the time. But going back to that Full Metal Alchemist thing, going back to that that, that nice little concept I love of if you take what you're given and add one to it, then it keeps growing and becoming better. Positivity. uh, The story has that infectious is almost the wrong word, because when you say infectious, it makes it sound unconscious. And to a little bit of a point, it is. But part of what I love about this is the active effort going on. 
lots of good people in the story and you're just constantly seeing little things of something nice is done for somebody yeah it's it's got that element going of you constantly see somebody take a nice thing that's done for or to them and then turn around and be kind to someone else as a result yeah i mean it's exactly that it's it's not about positivity in circumstances it's about positivity in how the characters deal with those circumstances again not always immediately positive uh, but it's about that that paying it forward and that being a supportive safety blanket that uh, constant is always there when you when needed and that constant like paying it forward paying it back and that's what allows that positive atmosphere to grow yeah and like any good protagonist, Amy herself is a very strong example of that. And Amy is a very bright and positive uh, person anyways. She's charismatic, talkative, like kind, all that stuff. But Her she also... Like thematic color is yellow, I mean. <laughs> yeah, she also takes the kindness of the people around her who come up to her even when she's a relative stranger help her get comfortable they help her get acclimated and all that and she very quickly turns around and does the same thing for oliver it's part of how she's able to approach it like i said she's an outgoing person who might do that kind of thing anyways but it probably would have taken a much longer time before she was ready to do something like that for someone else, especially somebody as unapproachable as Oliver, if she hadn't been shown that same kindness first when she was in a similar, if less intense place. Very true, yeah. Uh, and Amy is good for that. Uh, she is, like, her primary character trait is that she's always trying to, like, make other people happy and help them. She's a very friendly and kind person. You know, energetic, bubbly, always easy to get along with. The sort of person that anyone can find, can get along with and find common ground with. It does help that uh, she has synesthesia in a way that basically lets her experience like the flavors of a person's mood. and She's very in tune with the emotions of the people around her. Yep, and she processes them through flavor. Which gives her a bit of a leg up there, but by the same token, being aware of people's uh, state of mind and the way they feel isn't is is important. It's a it's the first step, but she's still at, the thing that's important about her is she's still proactive in acting on what she uh, understands. Yeah, she's she's a very active character in the best kind of way, and actually, kind of the rare. <laughs> the rare example of positivity not just being central to the thing of being something that consistently is moving the story and the care uh, the characters forward i mean i remember something i talked about in one of the last episodes is that usually uh positivity is much more reactive and um negativity is much more proactive but in the strongest examples of positivity like this proactive positivity is is a strong powerful thing and it's nice because there's not a lot of stories you get to really see where it feels like positivity is one of the things driving progress in the story but it very much is it's a uh, amy's drive to be a, like just be there for people and support them in any way she can is what moves the plot forward in space boy <laughs> it's her determination to help oliver and by extension, just the people around him that are involved in the situation, that pushes a lot of the narrative forward and gets her wrapped up in all of his story and things like that. And then when things start going badly for Amy, it is people's determination to do things that are right by her as well that also start moving the plot. It's, it is this just growing wave of positivity pushing forward the narrative and strengthening the resolve and the bonds between characters. Yeah. It's a nice feeling. And it's interesting because it does so in the face of a story that is legitimately, it's, it's legitimately a really dark story. And it's, it's interesting because 
it's easy to forget how grim the storyline, the just the the narrative itself actually is in the face of that positivity sometimes. Not in a bad way, like the the author's really good at at like punching you in the feels when it's the right time to do it. Mm. And if anything, it only hurts more because you're getting so attached to these characters and they're all just so good to each other. They're so kind and good and positive. So it hurts more when he does bad things to them. Yep. It's it's something you fall into when you're writing, though. You, you want to write good stuff. Sometimes you have to or actively want to be willing to hurt your little creations. That's they the, have to like, suffer for your art. <laughs> that's the interesting thing that they have to suffer for. That's very funny. But that's the interesting thing about Space Boy is that because of this, like, this inherent positivity in the way that characters act, is that even though he does put put his characters into these situations, he does hurt his characters, That's that allows that positivity to shine through because it gives them a reason to just be more positive. <laughs> Yeah, it's nice. But that that could actually lead to some interesting places, right? Now, you're a long ways off of getting to this point, but where we're at in the story now, we've seen a lot of the like the benefits of what this positivity can do. But there is a, there there is an unhealthy side to positivity. Uh, there yeah, is there this, is there is various types of toxic positivity and where we're at in the story right now uh we are actually starting to explore a lot of that i don't want to get too many spoilers or anything like that so i'll try to keep it vague uh but we're at a point now where the story is starting to like in a lot of ways examine how amy's can constantly helping other people is also not always healthy for her the way she is always putting other people first, always desperately trying to make everyone else feel happy and safe and loved, is starting to sometimes be at the expense of her own well-being, where she's not properly dealing with her own feelings. She's just running herself into the ground, trying to help other people. She's exhausting herself all the time. And at some point, something is going to have to give. And... It's like, right, she's talking, where I'm at, to, at the, the part where, where it is right now, she's talking to another character who is going through it, having a really rough time of things. And she sort of, in her narration, sort of says uh, something along the lines of, I don't have much to give right now, but this person needs this, so I'm going to give it to them anyway. Yeah, And it's... you can see it's starting to have a bit of a toll. She's tired. She needs a break, but she can't bring herself to stop supporting people for five minutes. I'm really glad that it's something they cover, because it's an important lesson for anybody who's outgoing and kind and caring in that way to learn at some point is, although it feels really good to do something nice for other people, both for the appreciation and just your own moral and empathetic satisfaction, that can only get you so far, and regardless of how far it can take you, sometimes that kind of goodness isn't what's going to solve problems you have or make you feel better from certain situations, and you have to be able to... It's... It's, it's always good to be kind and caring, but I, I subscribe to the idea that being selfless is not a good thing. And even if it's okay or good to be a little bit selfless sometimes, you have to be able to stop and take care of and worry about yourself every now and then. If you don't, you're going to fall apart. And then how can you help anybody? Exactly. Like, I am, I'm all for so like selflessness. I think it's, it's great to put other people ahead of yourself. Uh, at times. Yeah, no, I, I just mean great. like true selflessness, yeah, like to be supportive. Of but it's like uh, when the when it, when the uh, cabin of an airplane depressurizes and all the masks drop down, you are you are always told 
before anyone else secure your own mask first. And that's because you can't help anybody if you pass out. And yeah. it's the exact same situation, the exact same sort of principle of it's fantastic that Amy is pos- has this like positive outlook. She wants to help people all the time. She's so kind and considerate and empathetic. But if she continues to neglect her own needs all the time, she's going to break down eventually. And then she can't help anybody, including herself. And she's trying to juggle helping a lot of people right now where she isn't in the story. All while being in a really not a great situation herself. And it's not like she has no support. She's she's developed a support network and f- some new friends and stuff. Like People are still helping her out. But because of this facade, they aren't necessarily seeing how much she still needs the help. They think that she's improved a lot, and in reality, she is hanging on by a thread, I feel like. But it is interesting, because the person she's talking to at this point in the story is telling a story of basically how they did the exact same things she's do- she was doing in some ways. Ah, uh, yes. Thematic resonance. And it'll be interesting to see if that clicks. I'm looking forward to that. That sounds like a, that sounds like an enge- a very engaging part of the story. Oh, it's really good. This part of the story is also it's also doing a lot of exploration of the very complicated relationship between Dr. Kim and Oliver. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I can get into it a little bit without spoiling too much for you, right? Cause yeah, yeah, yeah. You know Oliver's lost his family. Yeah. And Dr. Kim, you have noticed, also doesn't have a family. Yeah, so I, I expect they're connected in that way. He, he uh, in various different ways, has lost his wife and his son, and he feels very strongly parental towards Oliver, which has led to some boundary-crossing issues and some unhealthy positive positivity from him as well, where he's trying a little too hard to support Oliver in some ways. Or he was. And that has led to a lot of tenseness and complicated feelings in their relationship. Oh, I got, I do look forward to learning that more. And, you know, um, as far as uh, writing goes, too, like world building and stuff, to a point, this is an advantage to the medium of comics or really any sort of writing that has a visual medium to go with it has over a classic novel, but that doesn't change the fact that the author of uh, Space Boys, really good at um, showing characters' personalities and character traits very thoroughly and consistently in the background without having to say anything or explain to us how, like how, for instance, even after Amy gets used to her, uh, her augmented reality glasses, after Amy gets completely used to and comfortable with them and is using them for everything she's supposed to, playing games with her friends, calling people, just using them casually and all that, she is still consistently, other than Oliver, who doesn't use them at all, she is consistently the only person in the room in many situations not using night gear. She's the only one amongst all her friends and most of the people who doesn't wear them literally all the time. Yeah, I mean, you, you touched on something interesting, like, a comic is never going to have the ability to, like, go as in-depth into a description of something as a novel, for example. Like, that's the strength of writing a novel instead, is that you can go really overtly deep into describing a scene, or a character, or a feeling, or something like that. But conversely, you can do a lot via showing things environmentally or with poses or expressions and that's something that a space boy captures really well is that the personality of characters is very well expressed through their mannerisms and their feelings well expressed through what they show on their faces it's a it's a very good medium for that sort of thing the ability to give you a, a visual idea of how a character is in their world. Uh, you know, nice. 
the the bright wide open like Amy smiles versus the very blank expression on Oliver's face as a contrast. Yeah, that is a good contrast. And yeah, I mean, the ability to just physically show things is a strength of any visual medium. Uh, I wouldn't say it doesn't like again doesn't necessarily make something better. It's just different, and it's something that I think is a good idea to capitalize on if you are going to tell a story in a visual medium. Yeah, and God and knows that Stephen McRae makes it. his stories expressive. <laughs> yeah, when feeling is so important to everything, like the. The paddles exploring the uh, feelings, like the flavors of different feelings as Amy experiences them with her synesthesia. Both gorgeous and engaging, but capture the vibe of how she experiences the world so well and to a point that you understand what she's feeling and experiencing. Yeah, they do it really well. It's nice. And, of course, I hadn't brought it up yet because you and I uh, discussed it personally and it's not necessarily... Um, on the positivity thing, but it is a good narrative element. Something else I love you don't get to see very often is a medium like a comic with first-person narration. And the same kind of first-person narration that feels good and that I enjoy from novels that I read. Yeah, it's a very interesting choice that you don't see a lot in comics. And the strength of first-person, of course, is that it makes a story feel more personal. It gives you a much better window into a character's head. And what's interesting about the way Space Boy is written is that it's not... And it can get away with this so well because it's a comic. Is that it bounces back and forth between first and third person seamlessly in a lot of ways. But this, uh, but we do frequently get like windows directly into Amy or Oliver's thoughts where they they narrate how they're feeling to the audience. And that's all, and that's often combined with a like symbolic visual representation at the same time. It creates a very, very personal, intimate feeling, and makes it really yeah. easy to both get into the character's headspace, but also to relate to them and just to understand how how the character is processing things and feeling about their situation and the people around them. Gives a little bit of extra artistic freedom to the. Uh to the author too because it means he doesn't have to constantly directly show us Amy or Oliver's face every single time he wants us to know how they're feeling. Yeah, and again, like it's not like the it would be weird if it was always in first person. But he he picks his moments very well because like most of the time the story is third person. It's a typical comic thing. But every now and then he like zooms in on how Amy or Oliver themselves are feeling. And gives us that first person window into their into their minds. Yeah, and it, well, part of what's nice about it too is it's not just always about their feelings. Sometimes their first person narration is also helping describe the scene we're looking at to us, and maybe giving us little extra details that we wouldn't miss or that they only notice because of who they are. Or it gives you an idea of how they see a situation compared to how another character does or how the audience does. Like, something yeah, that's reasonably very... common during those segments is not them talking about their own feelings, but talking about how they they think another character is feeling or experiencing something. Even if we, as an audience, know it's not quite right, for example. Yeah, it leaves it leaves room for error, makes it a, uh, makes it a personal interpretation, and it's just cute and helps us, uh, Helps us gel with the characters a little more, too. Yeah, look, from a storytelling perspective, it's a really interesting choice. And again, I like, I'm like i surprised by how well it works and how well the comic format allows him, uh, the author, to shift between these different points of view, these different perspectives, so seamlessly. Like, we can bounce from third to first to third real quickly, but it, but it's so narratively seamlessly, and I think that actually is in part because of the comic medium. Yeah. Like, when you read a, su a story someone's written, and they very suddenly change to first, uh, from first person to third person, or vice versa, it's jarring. It's usually a mistake. Uh, yeah, it, it's, 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 incons it's an inconsistency. 
generally if you see it in like a proper novel type setting but a comic kind of already is both first and third person at the same time yeah i i don't know if it's like just because his execution of it is so good or if it's something inherent to the comic medium but it flows from one to the other so well and you end up getting both a broader more omniscient perspective and an understanding of the world a more objective one and then you get brought into the personal level and you can and then suddenly you get this understanding of the world through that character's eyes as well and you can compare the differences you can see the differences in in the in the way the world is and the way different characters see the world it's great yeah hey I really enjoy it, and I'm looking forward to seeing how they continue to not just be positive with the characters, but characterize the positivity itself going forward. The story's been doing really good with it up to this point, and like really nice, hopeful, positive air where I know that even if everything's not always all right, these characters that I'm getting attached to and watching are always going to be doing their best to make sure it is. Yeah, and I think that's a good time to talk about the what are the main narrative thematic through lines in Space Boy, right? If we're going to get into like how it deals with positivity and stuff like that, again, as we should. <laughs> grief. Uh, grief of different varieties is very present in the lives of a lot of the characters in Space Boy. And not always in the same way, but like that sense of... Gr and not sadness, right? Sadness, yes, because it's naturally a component of this, but specifically grief and loss and how characters are processing that feeling and dealing with that in eventually positive ways, but not always at first. Uh... You, a lot of the time, characters have to go through a rough patch where they will uh, be processing and coping with, that, with with their grief and loss in a very unhealthy way, or a way that's unhealthy to others around them, and then will have to learn the positive coping mechanisms and eventually start handling it much better. You've got Amy, who, even though her friends and that are all still alive, Amy has to deal with, at first, very early on, has to basically begrieve that's a word right begrieve i think so uh she's grieving the loss of her old life because she can never go back to what her life was uh all all, all the people she used to know are just 30 years older than her now and there's nothing she can do to get that time back or to be once again at the same place in life as she was with her, the people she was closest to. Like, they can still be friends. They can, like, they can still communicate and have a connection, but it's never going to be the same because now there is 30 years of lived experience between them. If I remember it, I think she's about 15, right? So they're, yeah. they've literally gone from being the same age as her to three times as old. Yeah, exactly. Like and all that lived experience creates a a void between them, you know that she has to, she has to process that and accept that and move on. Uh, we deal with you know, Oliver, who's lost everyone in his life at some point for reasons. His method of coping is not healthy at all. It's been to, it's been to disconnect from his emotions and not allow himself to feel and process. Yeah. But at least for a part of that time, it was probably not just a coping mechanism, but a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Who knows if he could have held on long enough to make it to where we are now without that. Yeah, you have another character uh, who I don't think you've met yet, who has lost her parents and is, uh, and also her parental figure, and has to like cope with that. Especially because her parental figure, most kind to her, was not necessarily the nicest person to others, which adds another layer to that. You've got Dr. Kim, who uh, has lost his family in different ways, and he's dealt with that in a lot of ways by kind of imprinting onto Oliver and view starting to view Oliver as almost a replacement for his son, effectively. Which, you know, and, th and throwing himself into helping Oliver, which is not the healthiest way of dealing with things. Uh, another character loses someone 
and you know they're just so desperate for to feel like she's still out there that uh, he ends up in a cult effectively oh uh, he he becomes very vulnerable and preyed on and starts to believe everything that he hears from this cult and starts driving people away from him and they sort of have to dig him out of this hole and help him process things more healthily uh, in a oh. way that won't lead to him being victimized. Dang. Yeah, there's there's a lot of that sort of like that the grief and and loss is a constant through line in in Space Boy, and it it's that that hi- the one other thing that highlights the positivity in the story is watching characters process the loss, the grief, and the sadness. And be supported through that in such a way that they get they can get through it eventually in a healthy way. Above more than anything, I feel like Space Boy is a story about a health healthy ways to process loss. True, it's it's definitely already been a major element of it so far for both Amy and Oliver. Yeah, I'd like I that's not, I've not even covered every character it's relevant to. I look forward to meeting them. I talk about poignancy a lot, but there, but there's something very, it, it, there's a, there's a very beautiful kind of poignancy to the, to that sort of theme and the way it's handled in Space Boy, where it's not just everyone's sad all the time, lost bad, everything's shit. It's you've lost something, and it's okay to be hurt by that, and even to hold on to that loss to an extent, because you can never get that back. But you can't let it define you. You you know you need to be able to heal from that wound and continue on with your life and process it in a way that allows you to continue healthily on with your life. Life goes on, but look at everything else nice that you have waiting for you to come out and take it. Look at all these other good people in your life who are ready to help you get through this and make it better and be with you on the other side once you get there and yeah all that sort of good it's, stuff it's basically it, it, the the general thematic is it's okay to to grieve and to feel loss like it is okay to have those feelings and to sit in them for a little bit and to process them but you can't let them strangle you and that's yeah. like, that's one of the reasons i just i love this story is it illustrates that so well through so many different characters and it's the thing the thing that a person needs to get them through a, a time like that is not always going to be the same thing which is another thing i like about this story it's not like the it's not like every character has the same answer to getting through their their, their loss because it's a little different for everybody uh, yeah. but the but the consistent through line is a a strong and healthy support le- uh, network who are willing to aid you get through the situation in your way Space Boy is so that good. Is it's so fucking good. <laughs> I've really, really been enjoying it so far. I can't wait to keep reading more. I wish I could talk about it more with with uh, with you, audience. But we tried very hard not to spoil anything, especially if it's technically an ongoing story. <laughs> and unfortunately, you know, John here has got a long way to go through it still as well. So there's not. I think what would be really cool is to revisit this one at a later date, when we can have a full discussion of the story. Like, everything that's there. Absolutely. I mean, honestly, we could we could totally at some point have, a, have like, a comeback cycle that's just, uh, instead of sticking to a theme, is about revisiting uh, specific stories and topics we've already covered. That we just either couldn't finish because the story wasn't finished, or because there's just so much. Absolutely, that that is not a bad idea. I think it's fun. I think now, uh, for now, we can leave it there, especially in the face of the technical difficulties we've been having through this episode. Which hopefully we'll uh, once I edit this, you will be mostly spared from, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best, but yeah, given that, and given where we're at with the story and things like that, we can probably leave this one there for now. Uh, just, you know, in short, Space Boy's really good. It's a very happy, well, not really so happy, but a very healthy, positive story that deals with a lot of dark themes in a really positive way that is, makes it very compelling and engaging and enrapturing, and it's just so well written, and it's beautiful to look at too as an added bonus. That it does. It's very pretty both to look at and to read. 
the characters are really nice and the whole story is just imbued with a warmth genuineness and just like i don't know desire to like move forward and to be what it is it's a story that feels very much like it comes from not only the mind but the heart of its author i like that for now though that's where we are gonna leave it so if you are listening to this over on Google uh, Google Podcast or Spotify or something like that, you can find these episodes on my site, RadfordWrites.com, as well, where I also post stories and poetry, often the transcripts from stories you would have heard on this podcast as well. Uh, I post blog and article stuff over there now as well, talk a lot about my thoughts on different elements of writing and things like that. You can find me on social media as well i am daniel wright 7 on twitter or what is left of it and yes i will continue to make that joke till it does truly burn itself into the ground uh, i'm also <laughs> trying blue sky out at the time of recording uh, we'll see if it's how i'm doing with that when uh, you hear this but uh, i'm radford wrights over there as always you will continue to see more of john getting involved in my various projects doing a lot of uh, voice acting and narrating for me and of course, here we came here on this podcast. Yeah, making more progress on the streaming stuff too. Still haven't uh, done the actual streams, but still got to fix the mic. I, I, that's okay. I, yeah, I think I think this mic itself is okay, but I think my front USB port on my computer is bad. So I'll see if changing it fixes that. That's a mystery for you guys for next week. Will I have, will I complain about uh, any mic problems? Until then, we will see you later. Have a good time, everybody. Don't get lost in space.